I work in the University of Hong Kong. I spent about 20 years something in New Zealand before returning to Hong Kong to be a carer of uh, loved ones in my family and also some close friends using the mental health system. I married to one wife, just in case you're thinking Hong Kong is becoming lawless, okay? So it's only one wife. Uh, guys, what we're going to do uh, this afternoon is uh, we are going to have a debate. Uh, there are many, many debates, okay? And so uh, I think it's a lovely way to uh, bring people together and also uh, uh, bring a closure to this uh, wonderful, wonderful conference. Um, what we're going to do this afternoon is to debate the motion on the screen. And uh, it is a good topic we are going to uh, uh, reflect on what we have, have, have heard or what we have learned and try to tackle this uh, real world problem. And uh, the way we are going to conduct it is um, first of all, we will immediately move to do a counting to see where you are. Okay, where you guys are, are you supporting? Are you against this uh, motion or are you choose to abstain? And just to see how we go, okay? And after that, I will invite our debaters to speak for or against the motion. Uh, after the speaking, uh, we will also open the floor for some dialogues and also uh, questions as well. Um, I just want to let you know, you can uh, take part by posting your question uh, in the room here, raise your hands and interrogate our panel here. Or you can ask your questions through uh, Slido or through the uh, Twitter that you may uh, follow the event. Okay? And so after that, I will invite uh, one person from each uh, for or against side to do their final, final rebuttal. And then uh, we will do a counting again to see how uh, we think about the topics. Well, uh, my key role this afternoon is uh, to do two things. Number one is uh, I really like to encourage you to approach the topics thoughtfully and also sensitively because I realize a topics of this nature could be very, very close to home. So I want you to do that. The second thing is uh, let's all stick to the time. I have two reputations in my teaching. Number one, I reply my email obsessively. Number two, I am very, very good keeping my time. So uh, <laughs> let, let's stick to that uh, reputation. I want to make sure we all keep in time is this one, okay? Right, okay, so when you hear that, your time is up. Okay, um, yeah, I think I have uh, explained about the rules enough, and uh, again, uh, this is a good way to uh, put our final thoughts on a very, very important topic. Well, I'd just like to introduce our debate, uh, debaters very, very briefly, and uh, you can read their bios on the program, so to save time. Uh, on my left hand side, uh, we have uh, Peter, a uh, law uh, 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 professor, uh, and also we have Alison, uh, 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 a trainer uh, and also a researcher. And uh, Peter and Alison, they are speaking for the motion. Okay? And also on my right hand side, I have uh, John. And care of, and also I uh, have has a lot of influence on policy and so forth. And also I have Wiki, uh, a physician, a psychiatrist uh, in chief. Okay, and uh, uh, John and Wiki they are speaking against the motion, and that's why they're in red chair. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, that is the context. Uh, are you guys ready? <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, may I suggest one thing? Give a round of applause for yourself. Okay, I mean, stay in the place of Well, let's go to the grand uh, debate. And so uh, the first thing we want to do is let's do some counting. Okay? Um, listen, counting is serious because it is you making up your mind which way you go. Okay? 
Okay, and I think it's a good way to start orientating your thought of these topics. So may I invite someone to have the kind thing? Yeah, okay. Wow, are you ready? So I, I read the uh, topics again, and uh, the motion we have here is this house, this conference uh, congregation, believes that uh, there is no place for, com for compulsion in a, uh, in a rice oriented mental health system. Okay, so my question now, who will uh, support this motion? Raise your hand. You can sure I support this motion. There's no place for compulsion. Keep your hand there, please. I'm very clear that is what I want. big ideas. And I think my starting point is the presentation of Michael Rowe yesterday. What Michael did was he reminded us of the very long march to citizenship, which has happened among so many in our society, including the people in our mental health system. And it ties in with some of the things that Stephen was raising, uh, Stephen Allen was raising this morning and other people have raised. I want to start with a really quite simple but fundamental question for you. Do we think that the people in our mental health system are full? Use this mic. Because it's live streaming, so make sure you use mic. Yeah. That better? Yeah. Yes. Do we think that the people in our mental health system are full and equal citizens or not. That, in a sense, is the stark choice posed by this question. The so-called old paradigm of mental health law took the view that they weren't. The idea was that while we can debate about the scope of compulsion, compulsion of people because of what they were and I'm deliberately choosing very objectifying language there because it was a very objectifying process, because of what they were, they could sometimes be compelled. The debate was, what's the scope there? The new paradigm expressed through the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and other similar uh, language, uh, documents, instead starts with the position that people with disabilities are full and equal citizens. They may not be coerced because of their disability. On its face, that's no more than making rights real that the rest of society takes for granted. It is the same debate that Michael was raising about black and minority ethnic groups yesterday, women, LGBT plus people, and all others in our society have been demanding for so long. Lest you think this is pure pie in the sky, it is worth saying that the Parliamentary Assembly for the Council of Europe on the 25th of July this year unanimously, unanimously passed a motion 
saying that we should not have compulsion in our mental health services. For those of you that are in the UK, that's the Council of Europe. It is not European Union. It is not going away after Brexit. For those of you from the rest of Europe or the UK, your representatives voted for that. And the message of this conference is we can do it. Think back. We heard Natalie Drew talking about the Quality Rights Initiative, which is based on that kind of approach. We heard uh, Dr. Lichtenberg um, talking about soteria houses, which are based on that kind of approach. We've heard so much about peer support, about sports and that kind of program. We've heard about um, religious and other spiritual supports. We've heard about coaching. We've heard about all these mechanisms by which we can provide the services that people want. Last 30 seconds. Last 30 seconds, okay. The key thing there is we have to listen to people and that's what's put at risk by compulsion. It's an invitation because we, uh, professionals can overrule um, the uh, uh, listening to people, overrule engagement, they don't need to engage. It's an invitation to bad practice. I put it to you, this sets a wedge between us all. In post-revolutionary France, Philippe Pinel is said to have removed the chains from the insane. And that was thought to be radical, it was thought to be horrible, it was thought to be indefensible. I put it to you, we can do the same. Vote for this motion. We all have nothing to lose but those chains. Well, yes, alternate. Okay, alternate. Okay. So, who will go first? Be speaking against. Want to use this? You'll be fine. I'll be all right. Thank you. Well, uh, my name is John Copping. I am a carer, one of the half of the service provision that doesn't get paid, didn't want the job, and has probably got it till we leave the earth. But I'm not complaining about that. Um, I, my experience is exclusive in the UK, so I apologise, I can't relate to other activities that we've heard about uh, uh, early this morning from Stephen, for instance. Um, care, one carer cannot and should not represent others, so unusually for me, I'm going to speak about personal experience, but I think it does relate to the resolution, which is very um, uh, definitive. There is no place, it's absolute. Um, I have an adult son aged 50 who became seriously psychotic aged just 30 uh, as an adult and uh, he's been deteriorating for seven years, uh, he's been recovering for 10 years so I'm optimistic uh, and uh, um, mental health affects a whole range, the entire range of the population from people affected by learning disability to the most, some of the most gifted people in the world. The conditions themselves range from mild depression at the, uh, let, me, let me say the less severe end, to permanent psychotic conditions at the other end. And my experience is largely towards that end. In the UK, we, we are affected by acts of parliament. Um, many of us would prefer People not, people's actions not to be constrained by statutory law, uh, that doesn't affect all people, I mean. And uh, the, the acts concerned, as you well know, are the Mental Health Act, uh, which applies where there's an absolute need. Uh, I cannot forget the first occasion my son was in serious psychotic condition. Um, it, it's a shock to all of us, as, as you well know. Uh, he needed attention at that time. If they are a risk to themselves, and I will do this, or risk to others, I will do that, something has to be done, clearly. <coughs> the, the latter two, fortunately, haven't affected us. But I did live with a period when my son was absolutely convinced that I was the head of the CIA. 
and I had the President of the United States uh, in the palm of my hand. Just think about that today. Um, <laughs> on another occasion, he was telling me he was going to climb the, climb the church tower and fly off to the top of the hill on the horizon. I think in those times he was not really in much of a condition to make seriously sensible decisions. To me, there is therefore a need for that act. Community treatment orders uh, came in about 10 years ago in the UK. Uh, they obliged people to take medication. Uh, under, uh, there were major reservations about it because of the infringement of liberty involved. Uh, today, there is a management attitude that they're wildly overused. And in fact, I got involved as a nearest relative modestly, politely de de debating that with them not long ago. My son was on a certain outreach program, the most uh, resourced and therefore most, most unique, costly of, of all. He was remained for seven years, convinced he was not ill. He relapsed and got readmitted and became the proverbial rotating door. But we're ten years on for that, because of that uh, new clause with champagne every year on the 3rd of January to celebrate uh, another year gone by. Last 30 seconds. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I won't go into the Capacity Act, but consider decisions, immediate state of mind and the difficulty of managing it. Um, the resolution is absolute no. I wouldn't wish it for the vast majority of patients of the service but for my son, if he's one in a thousand, it has paid off for him enormously, personally, but it's also paid off in the cost of the uh, uh, non-admissions, millions of pounds probably. So much as I'm sad to oppose the motion, I do in fact oppose it in its absolute term. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Wonderful place to uh, stop the story. Well, let's turn to the uh, uh, speaking for the motion. Thank you. First of all, I must be honest with you, I've never been detained under the Mental Health Act. I've had seven or eight admissions to hospital in the late 1990s, early 2000s, and was at least twice threatened with admission, um, threatened with the Mental Health Act if I didn't agree to go in voluntarily, which speaks to one of the points that I'm going to make today. But my first main point, I have really two main points. Um, my first one is what anyway is a rights oriented or rights based system? We don't know what that looks like, particularly in the UK, um, but in many other countries as well, as we've been hearing over the last couple of days. We don't know what a rights based system would actually look like. We're far away from this at the moment. So I can only give you a few of my own ideas as to what that might look like. And I would invite all of you to think yourselves about what you think it would look like as well. So I would say one thing. Everyone who had already been in contact with mental health services would have an advance agreement regarding their choices and their, the treatments they prefer when they are lacking in capacity and that this, these advance agreements would have legal status and there would be supportive decision making um, in progress. People would be treated with dignity and respect, their views would be listened to. The most important thing I think for me is that there would be significantly enhanced community-based alternative services that provide safe spaces for people and where collective rights would be recognised in this country and in whatever country we're talking about, collective rights, for example, around poverty and access to welfare benefits for people. Um, and community inclusion, so one of, the, one of the rights under the CRPD, the right to community inclusion, would be a significant part of the picture, and there'll be services that provide support to people from marginalised and racialised communities. So within this imagined system, compulsion would have no part. The current justification for the mental health legislation is that is to keep people safe, is to keep the public safe, is to keep carers safe, the primary reason we need compulsion really is that the treatments are rarely effective and are frequently experienced as positively harmful. And the places that we provide this treatment are profoundly unsafe for people. 
In the same way that people do not want to take the medications that harm them, they do not want to go into hospital where they feel unsafe. So you have a circular argument where compulsion becomes a source of unsafety, not a source of safety. So I really do want to talk here about safety. The ethical and material violence inflicted by compulsory detention and treatment is disguised, effaced and excused by arguments about safety, protection and well-being. What does safety mean to people who are compulsorily detained? What does a safe space look like? We heard, uh, I heard, along with many people in the audience yesterday, a presentation by Frank Keating, who said that for the young, for the black men that he spoke to in his research, what recovery meant for them was being out of hospital and not taking medication. If that's what recovery means, why are we forcibly detaining people and forcibly giving them medication? Um, I would also want to mention experiences of abuse, targeted violence and abuse, and actually what we found was, without looking for this, was that a significant minority of the people that came forward wanted to talk about their experience of abuse within services. Okay. Um, so I, I really want to emphasise the need for safe spaces for people. Um, I want to finish with a quotation from Wilda White, a black American survivor and activist, who said the most significant cause of our continued oppression is the societal belief that people with psychiatric diagnoses or mental health challenges are not credible reporters or witnesses of our own experiences. When we speak, we are not believed. This is what will be, what has to be different in this right space mental health system. Thank you. privilege to be here and participating in this debate uh, this afternoon. I would like to uh, first share how vulnerable I feel, not only because this is my first debate ever, but also because I have to argue against the motion that so many of you uh, feel very passionately about while carrying with me the coercive shadow that comes from being a psychiatrist uh, working in tertiary care. In this context, I'd like to start by acknowledging the human rights violations that are pervasive uh, and are faced with people with mental illness and addictions. I would also like to agree that we need to a complete reset and transformation of mental health services and systems and how they're organized in partnerships with service users and their carers. I would also like to agree that there is no role for uh, <laughs> discrimination against people with disabilities and no roles for a Force first approach to any setting. With these caveats, I would now like to disagree with the absolute prohibition of compulsion in treatment settings for several reasons. Right now, we have several knowledge and consequently practice gaps that prevent us from safely de escalating certain situations or presentations that, left unattended, could result will result in great harms to affected individuals and their loved ones. Like in medicine, the rest of medicine, where people enjoy full citizenship, people are treated without, again, without consent when deemed appropriate, when they lack decision-making capacity. There are also people placed in, in quarantine when contagious to protect others. What am I to do if let's call him John, is brought to the emergency department by his family in the midst of a psychotic depression. The family are worried about his safety and his risk of suicide. And 10 minutes later, I find him in the bathroom trying to hang himself with his shoestrings. What civilized society would expect would accept abandonment if and when all other measures to de-escalate the situation to engage him, at that time unknown and unknowable to me, to arrive at the joint safety crisis plan. Let's, instead of uh, endorsing a motion that is not realizable, given our knowledge and skills gaps at this time, and rather sets 
service users and providers against each other. Let's work together to advance the rights of people with mental illness and addictions. Let's work together to advance the right to liberty, but also the right to life, the right to health, the right to justice, the right to employment, the right to housing, the right to, the right to adequate income support. And let's work together to prioritize and accelerate how we address these knowledge and skill gaps. So the day when we can say that there is no place for compulsion in rights-oriented mental health systems can arrive. But we're not there yet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Informalness we can express and communicate so powerfully and also effectively. It's not only professional knowledge, it's not only research, but also uh, in some cases our personal experience as well. What we're going to do now is uh, not only getting your vote, your earlier initial response to the motion, but the second part of your participation is we'd like you to engage in this important dialogue. Uh, I think, again, we are uh, able to do a couple of things. One, we can get questions from the Slido. And uh, at the same time, we may have time for one or two questions from people in the audience as well. Now, does this sound all right, guys? Sure. Okay. Well, uh, uh, let's look at this screen first and to see what we have. Uh, basically, what we have here is uh, people asking questions, and uh, we are going for the popularity ranking. And uh, is the ranking done very much? Okay, we are good. Well, um, the way we're going to do it is I will choose one or two questions and then I will pose the questions to the debaters, okay? And they decide which one will respond and how they will respond, okay? And uh, here we go. Well, let's do the first one. If not compulsion can happen in a mental health system, in this uh, forensic department, for example, what should happen to citizens who commit violent crimes in psychotic state? Okay, so anyone from the panel wants to respond? Okay. I can respond, but I think that the first <coughs> respond would be the ones that endorse okay. the motion. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, the horrible. It's not on. No, you have to switch that on. That better? Yeah. I have a horrible feeling that it's me. I take the point that that's difficult. The answer is that a whole lot of what we're going to, what you end up talking about if you talk about this kind of a system, does involve a rethinking of some of the other law that's relevant here. So basically, that's as much a criminal law question as it is a mental health law question. I don't think I know a single person who, working in criminal law at the moment who can honestly say that they're happy with the way the forensic system is working. I think most people feel that many of the distinctions between capable, incapable, are almost meaningless and our results are becoming dangerously close to arbitrary. I think also what the question just, for example, killed a loved one, is profoundly messed up, deeply guilt-ridden, and desperately looking for ways forward. <coughs> In the background of all of the, the question, it becomes a question of what's your criminal law system for, is it meant to be about vengeance? Is it meant to be about something else? All of those issues. Certainly, voting in favor of this question opens up a wide array of other questions. But I'm not sure that's an argument against the motion. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I would like to respond that voting for the motion, in fact, uh, would result in the criminalization of people with mental illness because they would all consider our free agents. Uh, I work in a facility that also has 200 forensic beds. Our premier recently called them animals because we have two abscondments and suggested that they should all be in jail for life. I disagree with that. 
a belief that forensic systems are not perfect, but that they are the best we have, and actually work to, perceive, uh, to, to reduce recidivism among people that have mental disorders. These are not criminals. These are people that, under impaired mental state, commit crimes for which they hold no responsibility. And I think going down that route um, and, and, and ensuring that there is no place for coercion in mental health settings also would imply that we're not able to treat people that would uh, otherwise be found criminally, uh, not criminally responsible. Uh, because we have several safeguards to be able to treat them, and actually we do successfully treat them, and the majority of the recidivism rates for this population are much lower than those treated in the criminal justice system. And that's a risk of this legislation. I had to learn a lot about forensics because uh, this summer in my organization we had uh, two very high profile abscondments from our uh, forensic beds. Um, and there was uproar in the community and uh, a premier actually called them animals and felt that they should be locked forever. So let's not let these debates result in actually losses in very hard won rights for people with mental illness and disability. Okay, any last comment from Vicky or John? Okay, well, uh, let's pick one more question from Slido. Okay, and uh, I will say uh, the one maybe we look at uh, the number three to begin with. Okay, so uh, the question or the statement here is. If the therapeutic alliance is the biggest indicator of success in therapy, okay, uh, what is the impact of someone being there against the view? Okay, so we have a, 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 a very challenging situation here. So anyone wants to respond? Yeah. It's talking about therapeutic alliance, but if you are forced to be there, okay, yeah. This speaks to one of my main points um, very powerfully. Um, so I think that the presence of compulsion undermines relationships, yes. undermines therapy, um, undermines recovery basically. Um, so I mean this this point is very much I think in favour of the in favour of the motion. Um, it, it's really, really difficult to form a therapeutic relationship with somebody, to be honest even. I mean so many of my um, friends and colleagues and including myself have lied at times because we know what would happen if we told the truth. That is the basis of the relationship when you know that if you actually told the truth, you are at risk of being um, placed under section. John, do you want to on that? Okay, Ricky? And the question I'm trying to remember the questions. Is the um, therapeutic relationship? What's the impact of being there against their will? Yeah. And uh, certainly, we're managing two competing demands: the uh, uh, responsibility of providers to ensure safety, and then the responsibility of providers to promote recovery and well-being. And sometimes they can be competing. Um, I think. Uh, there are concepts that are emerging that are called secure. Okay, well, I think we do have a bit of time. Now, uh, I'd like to open to the floor. I wonder whether there are any questions from the members here? You'd like to pose your questions or comments to this debate, and to this debate. Your turn now. Yes, on the back, please. Yeah, I mean... Uh, just, just wait for the mic, because it's live stream. It's interesting to hear the more on the right Thank you. Thank you for your call.
comment. Uh, we can let it oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I just want to say very much in support of what you say. Um, there is insufficient scrutiny in our inpatient wards. There is insufficient access for, people, for patients when they are inpatients. There is insufficient access to any form of redress. People are not believed when they report acts of violence by staff or by fellow patients. There is, there is not, I mean, there is a whole process called adult safeguarding in this country, which is um, administered by local authorities. And this does not reach inside our wards. We don't, we don't have access to redress. We do not have access to some means of um, being, of, of finding justice. Or staff as the provider organisation would like. Uh, clearly there's a balance between rights and resources. And I think it, there may be parts of, of the world, if you like, where if you cannot provide the staff to provide the sort of safety, safe services that the lady is referring to, what do you do if you've got people with the characteristics described by my colleague here? Uh, I don't have the answer. It's a resource issue and a management issue as much as it is a legal issue to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, what comment here? Yes, um, we, um, we, need, we need to have the mic because yeah. it's live stream. So that's why. Thank you so much. I was detained for six months and it was the gateway to my recovery. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I was detained for six months and it was the gateway to my recovery. But interestingly, having heard this gentleman's talk about Satiria this morning, if that had been available, mm -hmm. then I probably wouldn't have needed to be detained for six months. Mm -hmm. The problem was that I didn't feel I could keep myself safe. And the only way that I knew that would happen was if I was detained. Mm -hmm. So I partly enjoyed but it was the gateway to my recovery. Yeah. And, but we need more services like Soteria mm -hmm. and other options and to unpack when people are in danger of being detained as to what's going on for them right. as to why they got to that point. Thank you, thank you. So you make comments about resources and also the opportunity. Okay. Um, any other comments, questions, before I invite uh, members in the panel to respond, okay? Any questions, comments? Right, thank you. It's excellent, the energy is building up. Can you, can you see that? Yeah. Running, 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 running. <laughs> Thank you so much. Please. Thank you. Um, I've just got a comment following on from um, other people. Um, I feel like people aren't given help until they reach absolute crisis point mm -hmm. and that can then lead to the need um, in inverted commas for deprivation of liberty yeah. and if people were actually given support sooner mm -hmm. that wouldn't happen and as a service user myself I was crying out for help for a very long time um, and finally at a crisis point that it was only then that I was given the option of being detained or going into a crisis house. Mm -hmm. And I chose the option to go into a crisis house. And even though that seems like a very artificial decision, the fact that I then still had some autonomy to be able to choose mm -hmm. where I was going to go, that was instrumental in my recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just really interesting to hear everybody's um, perspectives. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there is absolutely yeah. a room to improve how we deliver mental health services in partnership with service users and their carers. Um, I think we, uh, there is a role and we could set targets to absolutely decrease seclusion, restraints, and voluntary admissions. Do I believe with our current state of knowledge we can? This morning, 10% were turned to hospital, presumably from some involuntary detention or treatment. Um, and uh, even if we were to implement uh, all recovery-oriented measures that we could, and we should prioritize doing so, we would not be able to absolutely prohibit um, the uh, involuntary treatment <coughs> and detention. Excellent. 
uh, here for the comment, please. Yes, just to say, um, just to remind us really that we are thinking, imagining um, a system that we don't actually have at the moment. So a rights-based system where these alternative services would be available mm -hmm. and there would be safe spaces for people to go. And I totally agree with the people who've said that, that often you don't get help until the point, and it's more like that now with the, the way in which austerity has affected our services. You don't get help until uh, a crisis has been reached and that in, in, increases the use of the Mental Health Act. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So there is one comment. Yeah, we need a mic to live stream, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Please, I, I'd love to hear what you think. Please. Hello? Is it working? Uh, this is more of a kind of very, very broad observation. Mm -hmm. What kind of societies are we living in that mm -hmm. are producing these levels of distress, these levels of crisis, mm. and to me, obviously, No, don't respond to one spot. Okay, uh, any, any last one of the comments? <laughs> any last one? Okay, thank you. Goes to that one. Yeah. Can I yell it out? No, no, no we need the mic. Please, please, please. I'm very sorry, but uh, we, we want the wider audience to, to enjoy our discussion, to benefit from this discussion, please. That may be the last, last one. Okay, yeah. go. So I, I wonder if part of the problem is that our misunderstanding of what it is that happens when somebody is in this position of uh, potentially threatening their life or somebody else's life, mm -hmm. which at least in the United States is the, really the only criteria which would get you hospital that people can be in. And we need to think about the difference of what that means. Because a lot of people can get into an extreme state who don't have a mental illness of any long standing at that okay. moment and could think about a whole range of things. Having said that, it does seem to me that we need to be able to respond to what happens when somebody's in that state, which they will no longer be in, in some period of time, unless they carry forward their actions. Okay, thank you for the observation. Well, what I would like to do is, um, uh, Pina, can you, do you want to respond to the earlier comment? In one minute or so, yeah, and then I will invite uh, the panel members to deliver their final, final rebuttal, and I will invite uh, Vicky or John Gomez. Okay, Peter, any thoughts? Uh, I think I want to pick up on a couple of points that have been made. The question, I think, is how helpful diagnostic criteria or mental health criteria mm -hmm. are in the discussions we're having. Um, I think what troubles me about what Vicky was saying about the criminal stuff, I did some work on people who were committing some serious crimes a few years ago. And I have to say that the line, I certainly take the point that I felt tremendous sympathy for some of the people that you're describing, but I have to say I also felt tremendous sympathy for a lot of people who were not the people you're describing. Mm -hmm. I'm not convinced that when we're talking about who we should be compelling, mm -hmm. mental health status is a very helpful indicator. And that picks up on something that the lady up there was saying. Why do we only engage when it becomes a mental health problem? Yeah. If your real problem is poverty, maybe that's what we need to talk about. Okay. And maybe that's about a lot more people than people with mental health problems. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Similarly, if I walk into the bathroom here, or the, the washroom here, and find somebody hanging from a cord, I am not going to ask whether they have a diagnosis or not. I'm going to cut them down. I'm not going to do a capacity assessment. I'm going to cut them down. 
That's what human beings do. Okay. That's not a mental health issue. Okay. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Okay, um, well, I think we have just finished our uh, in the room kind of discussion here. We pretty much reached the uh, second final stage of this debate, and uh, what I would like to do is to invite one person from each side to deliver their final rebuttal. Uh, they will be given two minutes, and uh, uh, take it from here. And I'd like to invite uh, uh, Vicky or John to deliver the rebuttal. Uh, first, to clarify, we agree that disabilities should never be the sole reason to sustain one's right. There is no disagreement in there. I think this decision should be made on somebody's decision-making capacity or capacity to voice what is uh, their decision about care, like the case that was just described. We find somebody hanging on a string. And, and um, the um, uh, safety considerations, how great could be the consequences of non-intervention? nothing to do with the diagnosis of mental illness. Um, the motion, though, however, threatens hard-worn rights about people with mental disabilities, including those that are involved in the criminal justice system. This uh, defense of non-criminally responsible would be abolished. And yet we know, I'm not a forensic psychiatrist, but I am the chief of staff of a hospital that has 20, 100 forensic beds, we know that these individuals have better outcomes that go through the criminal justice system, and the risk of recidivism is low. So instead of advocating for a motion that puts patients or service users and providers against each other, let's work together to prioritize minimization of coercive interventions in treatment settings. Let's work together to implement alternatives in the community, like Hysteria House, like Advanced Directives, um, like coaching, and everything in our armamentarium at the moment. It's, it, let's also continue addressing the knowledge gaps, the sign gaps that prevent us from actually providing effective treatments and cures to people affected by these conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to come back to my theme of safety and also um, the, in the existing present system, the fact that we are, uh, that services and systems are lazy and they, they constantly revert to the Mental Health Act uh, when it isn't necessary. I think that the, the issue of safety um, still predominates. We, the, the discussion about safety is always in the wrong direction, as far as I'm concerned. It's in the direction of, public, of society. We all have rights. Members of the public, we are members of the public too. People who have uh, mental health um, diagnoses are also members of the public. So, yes, sometimes the rights of different people conflict with each other, and that we have to be open about and really resolve and look to how we resolve. But in a rights based system, we need to have services that provide um, safe spaces for people to go before they reach crisis. We always end up, these debates always end up focusing on people at extreme, in extreme circumstances. That's because the people who are at each end of the debate wish to make it as difficult as possible for the other people to win. What I'm saying is this debate is about all of those people who today are detained under the Mental Health Act and who are having a shit time in hospital because it is not a safe space. We need to be thinking about the rights of everybody who is in that situation. Thank you. Wow, so good. Thank you so much. Uh, a, uh, a, a, a massive thank you to our debaters. Well, pretty much we come to the uh, last stage of this uh, uh, debate and uh, I'd like you to respond to the motion again after hearing some of the uh, comments and also uh, material about the uh, discussion and also the questions raised through the Slido and also through people in the room here. The motion we have here is, listen guys, this house believes there is no place for compulsion in a rights-oriented mental health system who say yes to the statement, raise your hands. There is no place for compulsion. Counting, please. Mm -hmm. 
da, da, da. Okay, finished? Okay, thank you, thank you so much, thank you. Well, let's do the next thing. Okay, so to those who abstain from the uh, vote, please raise your hands. Abstain. Can you guys see from the back? Yeah, come over the front. So we will have the results shortly, am I correct? Right. Okay, well, shall we give a, a, post, a round of applause to our speakers? <laughs> um, I'm sure they have given a lot of thoughts to their preparation. Um, while they are pretty much uh, putting the counting together, I think it is the time for me to uh, say a couple words to uh, finish this uh, conference. Uh, in fact, I'm not going to say much because I think it would be absolutely anti-climate uh, to give you a, 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 a speech. And, and also the fact that I'm mentally incapable of summarizing <laughs> the uh, conference. Well, what I would like to say though is is uh, the meeting starts by my and also by the uh, person to uh, blow a chump. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, what I would like to do is take this guy generously. Well, I can kind of have three people who are generously enough to share what you thought about the conference. Maybe things you have not thought about or things you may do. Can I kind of have that? Because, look, as uh, we start the conference, this is a, a learning community. We are traveling to the end. Anyone would like to share, please? I love to have three. Yes, please. Look, by the way, I'm a stubborn and stupid professor. Okay, when I say three, I really want to hear three. Please. <laughs> um, I think it's been inspiring. Yeah. Um, I think it's been uh, challenging. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's been a lot of curiosity. There's right. been a lot of interest. Yeah. Ask and I've really question. enjoyed it. I found it absolutely brilliant. Thank and you. I thank Mike. It's only four minutes ago, okay? Yeah. Two more people, please. Yes, yes, um, two things. So, firstly, I think it's very easy when you work in mental health to keep your head down and to just do the same thing every single day and believe there'll never be any change. Yeah. And it's really encouraging and inspiring to see the vast amount of research behind mental health to show that there can be improvements to vast systems and then that dribbling down to individual levels for patients. And secondly, I've never been in a forum in which it's so comfortable to be a mental health service user and to be a mental health service worker. Um, and it's such an inspiring environment to be in. You feel very comfortable. <laughs> okay, last one. You can have a question. I really want to say something, otherwise you can't sleep tonight. <laughs> okay, cool. Please, please. Should I do this somewhat? You saved me! <laughs> Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Um, so, for me, it's, this, this uh, conference has been amazing, immense, like really high quality all the way through. Um, and for me, what I've learned the most about is what's going on in the rest of the world. I was entirely unaware of the conditions, for example, in um, Eastern Europe and those kind of things. It's been a real eye opener.